Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Spiritual Connection Show. I'm your host, Katie Augustine. So I'm the spiritual head of the Transformation Center CT based in Westport, Connecticut. I'm also a transformation coach. I'm an energy healer, shamanic practitioner, and a spiritual leader. So thank you for joining us today for our show. As you know, the Spiritual Connection Show is all about connection. You know, it's about connecting with each other um, through, through the screen, as well as connecting more fully with our own spiritual selves. You know, you're going to learn a lot from all the guests I have each week, um, you know, what they're up to, what resources they have, just see what's in it for yourself, you know, and you're able to contact them. I'll show you their information as well. Um, so before we get started, um, I just want to introduce my guest, who is Kathy Boyle. So welcome to the show, Kathy. Pleased to be here, Katie. Yeah, so I just recently met Kathy on Zoom. You know, everything's on Zoom now. Um, she was a speaker at our Westport Sunrise Rotary Club a few weeks ago. And I just really, you know, loved what she had to say and just really connected with her in a, in a, in a great way. So I, I thought she'd make a good guest for our show. Um, and i just tell you a little bit about her before we get started, and then I'll show you um, her info on a slide. I'll do that on the share screen right now. So Kathy Boyle is the CEO of both Chapin Hill Advisors, as well as Kathy Boyle on the go. And she is a master connector, unbelievable. Um, her talk at the Rotary is about how to meet a thousand people at lunch, if you can believe that, and it's true. Um, so she's been profiled in magazines and she does guest spots on TV and radio all the time. So I'm really thrilled to have you here with us this evening, Kathy. Well, thank you, Katie. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. So, you know, the first question, as you know, that I'd like to start with um, on the Spiritual Connection show is to ask my guest, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of your spiritual journey, you know, where you are, what's important to you, anything along those lines. Cool, me too. So um, I actually grew up in both Brooklyn, Connecticut, uh, Brooklyn, New York and uh, Kent, Connecticut. We had a second home up in Kent, we go up there. I'm the oldest of nine. So growing up with very strict Irish Catholic family, had to go to church all together. We knelt and said the uh, ro rotary together on Sunday nights. My father would say his prayers every morning, kneeling by his bed before he left um, to go to Wall Street. Um, but there was a real lack for me of connection with the church. It felt more forced, ritualistic. Um, I really, honestly, when I was uh, probably in high school, I began to feel very disenfranchised with the Catholic religion. You know, it's very male dominated. It's a lot of rituals and um, they are condescending towards pagan and paganism yet what's the difference you know priest gets in big robes and you know prays at an altar and does all these different things that we do and i also felt that there was a lack of um reality of practice more like preach rather than practice and so when i went off to college i actually uh, did tm i did transcendental med meditation and uh began to get more into um more spiritual types of paths and so at this point, that's really where I am. I practice um, hot yoga, Bikram yoga is is my go-to. And I really do feel a connection with God and do believe in, um, you know, higher power, where they call God, divine source, whatever. But I do think um, it, without that, I think that we are lost. And I think that that is one reason in the world today in general, not just because of the pandemic, but I think that that's one reason why people are reaching out and searching because a lot of us grew up, especially in the baby boomer and the Gen X generations, we grew up with sort of like forced ritualistic must practice. And then as we've grown, we've mixed marriages. So we have Jews married to Catholics, Christians married to um, uh, Jews, uh, Indians, uh, Muslims, et cetera. I was engaged to a Muslim. And um, so I think that what happens is it becomes so deeply embedded in our family history as to which religion you're gonna practice and what you're gonna follow that people don't choose to do anything 
or they honor just sort of the rituals like Hanukkah. It means gifts, eight days of Hanukkah or 12, whatever number of days, or I'm sorry. Um, and then Christmas, you know, Christmas becomes a universal holiday rather than the birth of Christ, you know, and, and the meaning of really uh, the Catholic and Christian religions. So, so that's my feeling and that's my view on the world at, at this point. I'm also vegan. I love animals. I think I must have been an animal in another life. So I'm really, really connected with animals and hate to see the suffering of them. And so that's what I believe is my mission on life is that I was put here to help end the suffering of animals as many as I possibly can during my lifetime on earth. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, so that's, you know, I, I agree with your, your philosophy there because we're all one, we're all connected, whether we're human, animal, plant, you know, we're all here, we're all one. And um, I think we're here to help each other. That's really, um, that's, you know, one of my missions is to help other people find what's true for them. Because I think, you know, like you, it was a journey. You, you found what, what, what your truth was, what worked for you. Right, right. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that I can say when you go to mass on Sunday, I, I have, um, I'm now selling PPE, uh, personal protective equipment during this crisis. And so I've gotten to meet this array of very funny characters across the country. And one of the fellows that I talk to on a regular basis now is a very religious Orthodox Jew from Brooklyn. And um, they have some rituals that I really, really find disgusting. Like they kill chickens, they slit the neck of the chicken. And he tried to explain to me why it wasn't harmful to the animal and how the animals were being donated afterwards. But as a vegan, of course, I'm against killing any kind of animal for any use whatsoever. Um, and um, just talking to him about, I, you know, kind of silly in the modern day that on Saturday they can't turn on electricity. So they have everything programmed and they keep the oven on warm from Friday night all the way through Saturday evening. I, I had no idea. I mean, just talking to him about the actual practical. So here they, you know, the old days, you just want to slow down. And that's what I talked to him about. He said, well, you know, don't you think in today's modern day that here you are creating electric that goes on and off automatically. So you don't have to touch the switch, but you're still using electricity. And so he, he's, he feel he has five children. So he says on Saturday, at least they slow down. They slow down and they focus on family. And I think that that's where the ritual comes in. So if it's mass on Sunday or Saturday night or uh, Saturday observ observing as uh, the Sabbath, um, I think that that's the role that it does play in our lives is that we take the time to pause. We take the time to look at our inner selves and connect with our immediate family and our immediate, our bigger circle of friends that practice in the same religion. So I think that is the role that it plays and where it's serves in a positive manner. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. That's a good point. It's, it's like, what is the meaning behind the ritual? You know, what is, it, it started as something. So it's, it's almost, um, you know, coming upon us to keep that going, that part of it going and not just the superficial side of it. Right. So that's right. punch the punch the check mark. I went to church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And I think that, you know, that probably is one of the issues with, with organized religion in general. And, and I know a lot of people that, um, you know, get a lot out of it and it really is important in their lives, but there's just as many people that have found their own way without that. You know, so I think, and what you said at the beginning, a little while ago, I think is important that we find that connection. What mm -hmm is because what's what's bigger than us you know it's not we're not here alone right right we couldn't possibly no so that's what's going to um make a difference in our in our lives i think ultimately um, right i i think that the one of the other issues that i was thinking about in preparation for this uh show when i was driving i was just thinking about what i would say and I do think that it's like anything else that's mysterious and mystical. It's, you can't see it. And so just like the coronavirus, many people are not wearing masks and they think that they put a bandana on their face, they're covered and protected. And many people are taking the masks off and dropping it down to their chin. And that's actually the worst thing you could possibly do because if there are viruses, the, the bacteria is on the outside, you've now just attached to your skin. And so people don't think through this all the way. And I think because they can't see it, 
And um, I saw something this weekend where they took a blade of hair as the reference and then showed you the different sizes of the various bacteria and plagues that are out there and how tiny these, these molecules are. And I think the same thing with um, spirituality is you don't believe in a higher power many times or you become disenfranchised from because you can't see it. And it hasn't touched your life in some way that's really impactful, then you don't believe it's really there. Hmm. Yeah, I think we have as a society gotten to that point where it's like we want, um, yeah, we want tangible, you know, physical, physical things right. to, to quote prove that something's happening. I mean, there is a lot out there actually about energy and how it how it does work, even when we can't see it. There's a lot of research, but when you're right, people are skeptical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It has, I mean, yeah. You know, I work in a Wall Street kind of job, right? Um, so my company does succession planning and we also have a wealth management firm. So on that side of the fence, I'm expected to be left brain, right? And a very real and present in today. It's like, prove it to me, empirical numbers, right? It's all about the numbers and not about the, so you tend not to go forth with this side, the spiritual connection or believing in, you know, miracles essentially, right? And that's often what can happen if you do believe and the power of connecting the divine source. And, you know, I talk about in the talk that you saw me uh, give, I talk about abundance and believing in and believing in karma. And I call them psychic chits in the universe. You know, I'm great connecting and uh, great at connecting other people. And I always believe in doing the right thing and giving it away. And so I will, I can't help myself. I just connect people and I say, oh, you know who you should meet? Oh, you know who you should meet? And then I will make a connection and, and I don't expect a repay. I don't expect that person to come back to me and say, let me introduce you to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that you put them out in the universe and it will come back. And, you know, some people have trouble with that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. It's, um, what we put out there, we get back, no doubt. I mean, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. You know, and that's how um, you talked about manifesting. That's how we manifest what, what we really want is by asking for it and putting out that vision, you know, that, um, that I mean, it's just a desire, but it's, it's a little more than that, I think. Right. I think the more tangible you can make it, thus the vision board. Right, mm -hmm. and then writing it down. Um, one of the one of the tools I've used in the past. Um, I get colonics, and I forgot what she calls the foot thing, but it takes toxins out of your body with a foot bath. And this gal's very lovely, but she's totally you know new agey, right? And so some of some very new agey people can't translate into sort of left brain centered sort of. Uh, stuff. So you lose the translation, right? And that's where people tend to doubt. And so she told me to go get this book. It was called 30 Days to Prosperity. And I was like, yeah, 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 I will, I will, I will. And uh, I finally did. And, you know, it's really written by this woman about manifesting abundance in your life. Um, and it, for that particular book, it's actually about money and it's about bringing wealth and abundance into your life if you've struggled. And I went through a very difficult period a few years ago. And so this was, this for me was a saving grace, be able to read the mantra every day. You know, you sort of meditate, get yourself into a zone and then read it out loud. And then you write it down. And by writing down whatever it is, the mantra for the day, and it's 30 days and you, it gives you hope. Even if, you know, if you're crushed, you know, right now, a lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are feeling they don't despair. They don't know what to do next. They don't know the alternatives for work are, are minimal. And, you know, so many people being locked down or having a family member that may be at risk. So they're afraid to go out and reach out. But, you know, we're this lockdown has just caused so much economic harm. And so a tool like that can be a guiding light to, you know, just being able to say, okay, what is it that I'm good at? Where can I bring this, you know, or just trust in the universe and just trust to that it will come and show you the way. Mm, absolutely. <clears throat> and what is the name of that book again, Kathy? So for our audience. 30, 30 Days to Prosperity. And I meant to uh, uh, look up the gal's name, the author. It's uh, She's got two last names. I can't remember the name of the author. Yeah. Well, that's okay. 30 Days to Prosperity. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you can get it on Amazon, it's like $10, $12, something like that. All right. And you definitely recommend that. Yeah. I found it a great tool. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's great. I mean, it sounded like it helped you turn around a difficult time for yourself. Yes. And, you know, I love Tony Robbins as well. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and Tony's one of my favorites. You know, he's just like, he's got such energy. He's just transformed so many people's lives and made so much. And if you listen to his story of starting with nothing and being so poor that his, you know, his little jalopy, I think it was a VW, barely making it, you know, and then the first time he actually saw all these people coming. But one of the things that Tony um, had mentioned in one of his podcasts is that you can change your energy just by, um, physical exercise. So you could actually just clap your hands really loud or do 10 jumping jacks and that it can change the state of your mind. Our mind is so unbelievably powerful and we lose track of it because again, we're so physically grounded, I think in our bodies and about external exercise and eating, et cetera. But we lose track again because we can't see it, but just changing that mentality. And it is amazing when you wake up and, and you're scared, you're frightened, you're anxious. Um, just doing something as simple as this, as listening to podcasts, as reading something like this abundance, uh, you know, the prosperity book, um, or just getting up and just doing jumping jacks and just changing your mindset, you know, because you are what you believe. And so if you believe you're positive and, and can go forward and put forth that energy that's positive, it really will change your light and it'll change everybody around you that you interact with. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're you're a great example of that. You have such positive energy. It's just it's contagious, you know. <laughs> yeah, people want me to bottle my energy and sell it. <laughs> like could I be a gazillionaire? <laughs> Do you have a secret source? I mean, I know you're connected spiritually. Is there anything else that comes up for you that um, you think would be helpful for people to know about? So I think one of the other things is um, when I was starting out, I, I went to Michigan State to be a veterinarian just because I love animals. But unfortunately, the average veterinarian is actually really services the Aggie industry, the meat industry. And so here I went away. I was a vegetarian from the time I was 16, just wanted to be Dr. Doolittle. And I went off to Michigan State and having been, you know, a bright kid in a small town in Richfield, Connecticut, I could like ace the exams with very little prep. And all of a sudden I'm now in pre-med, pre-vet classes with all the brainiacs from around the country. <laughs> and um, and suddenly I was introduced to boys and partying and fun and a whole balanced life that I never had before. And um, uh, I actually work for a veterinarian as well and, you know, very old fashioned kind of vet. But I had to take poultry science and animal husbandry. And this is about the meat industry. It's about killing animals and making sure that they're they're fat content is enough for the American who likes it marbled. And for me, that was horrible. So I always wanted to go to Colorado. And my parents wouldn't let me, again, gave me the whole like, oh, if we spend that money on you, we won't help the rest of the kids. And so there's the Irish Catholic guilt. And so I actually just flew the coop. I, I actually went to Colorado and I lived there. I was a ski bum. I had so much fun. I waited tables at night. I danced after that, did country swing. And it was just a blast. And when I came back, I was engaged to a guy who worked on Wall Street and I taught aerobics and I wanted to open an aerobic studio on the East Coast. And um, so I came back here with the idea that I would get a job on Wall Street and meet guys that would fund my aerobic studio. So that was my original premise. And I had no idea what I was getting into, Katie. I got a job at Merrill Lynch um, in the back office, $13,000 a year. And I waited tables on the weekends, actually in Westport. And I did color analysis for women. And so I would do color color analysis, supplement my income. And, um, and I got into Merrill Lynch as a broker and stockbroker. And I was terrified of selling stuff. I didn't, I didn't even understand what a stock was. And we had a practice on one another. And I remember one day I practiced a quote, a pitch on Bristol Myers to this Texan who was in the group. And I got finished. And I said, what do you think? He goes, darling, your mouth moves faster than my brain can think. It was so funny, but I didn't understand what a stock was. I was terrified of losing money for other people. I don't like to, I have very low risk tolerance for other people's money. So I was very lucky. The trainer, I was in a great class. We had a wonderful, wonderful uh, joie de vie, you know, and um, you're in class for three weeks, by the way, of nonstop learning. You go from knowing nothing to having to then go pitch people and manage their money. And um, one of the trainers was coming out with a book on neuro-linguistic programming mm. and he took pity on me. 
I had worked as a sales assistant for Attila the Hun in the Stanford office of Merrill. And this guy would put his feet up on the desk and smoke a cigar starting at two o'clock in the afternoon. And he was only about six or seven years older than me, but you know, he was, he was the man and I worked for him. And um, he told me all these negative things about Merrill's research. Don't ever trust this and don't buy that. And as a rookie, you're only allowed to buy what Merrill tells you to buy. And so I was terrified and my knees were shaking. I got on the phone with somebody cold calling and I couldn't even talk. And as you can see, I could talk to anybody about anything. So this guy, Steve Drozdak took me in a in the room and I'll never forget this. He had me, I wore a little ring. I had the tiniest engagement ring under the sun. I still had it. And he had me take the picture of the man I worked for that was making me so anxious and throw it out the window. And we saw it get smaller and smaller, and smaller. And since I had skied, I competed freestyle. So I was a very good skier and bumps. And he had me picture myself going down a bump run sunny day, blue sky, Colorado at its best, and just boom, 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 you hit every bump. And he had me ground that feeling into my ring. And to this day, Kate, I can still touch that finger. The ring's long gone. I can touch the finger in the same place and this inner feeling of power comes in. I don't think I would have survived being a rookie broker and making a hundred phone calls to strangers every single day without this. I was so terrified of getting on the phone and every day that I would dial, I would touch the finger before I picked up the phone. And that's what gave me the courage to get through. So there's a very personal experience of something where, you know, NLP of just also, I mean, neurolinguistic programming is really about, you know, understanding the language between us and how we take data. And most of us are visual, but some people are auditory and something like kinesthetic. But this guy in doing this training did this very powerful exercise. And I'm just so grateful to him for having done that. I don't know if I would have stayed in the business if, if not for that. Wow, that's an amazing story. It's a, it's a great example too of how something you know seemingly small can make such a huge difference in our inner lives. And I think you know NLP is a wonderful program. You know, um, I'm actually in one of their courses right now, um, doing it. It's it's um, a hypno hypnosis uh, course, but it's, it's it's great stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing when you get up to go and speak on a stage of your, you know, public speaker. I did an event at Saks Fifth Avenue with a big audience. It was all women. Um, and I was on the board of Financial Women's Association. And uh, so I drew in the financial crowd. And it was a combination of it, dressing for success. It was style that works. And then each of us had a message about whatever we did. So I did actually sales skills in that case. Um, and I had a sales coach. And so she would come in with fake people, you know, styrofoam people and put them in the audience. And then she would watch me and give me tips. But one of the techniques is before you get up on a stage is the same thing is to center yourself, right? Breathing, meditation, et cetera, which is hard to do when you're sitting at a lunch table, with 10 people. But that's where I found also, this was my little secret sauce that I could touch the ring and it worked in the same way of just empowering me. And so I think that's really a wonderful example of your inner spirit and being able to connect it to your physical self. Right. So, yeah, so that's something that, that all of us could do. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of finding what works, what works for ourself and you know, that works for you. So that's great. And it's stuck with you all this time. Yes, it's a long time ago too. Yeah, so it was 30 years. Well, you've had such an interesting life. I know we have a lot to talk about, but one thing I'd like to ask you about, we have about oh, like six minutes left. And one thing I'd like to talk about is your animals, because you mentioned that at the beginning, and, uh, and I know you're really into that. Can you share a little bit about what you do? Sure. So my big mission is, unfortunately, we don't get at the root of the problem. We don't neuter spay. There's no forced neuter spay. We have puppy mills that are rampant. Oprah has spent so much money and time trying to end puppy mills, and yet we still see them. You know, dogs are never touch the ground. And if you buy a cute little puppy at a a puppy store, that's where it came from. The Amish are the biggest perpetrators of puppy mills in the country. And people don't think of that. What is a puppy mill? Can you tell us about that? So a puppy mill is a breeding ground where these dogs are kept in cages. They're fed horribly. They're not allowed out ever. They don't have any life and they're just bred every six months. And by four or five years old, they're usually used up and then they dump them into kill shelters. 
Oh, that's terrible. So what are you, do you work with a nonprofit? Did you start a nonprofit? What, what is so, it? So no, what I do is I use my connecting skills. I work between the not-for-profits. So there's hundreds, thousands probably of, of rescue organizations. Not all of them are good actually. Some of them are evil and they actually take an emaciated dog and show it and raise money. And then there's actually no way to track this stuff. And so you'll see these posts. So what I do is I use my skills connecting to go between the rescues and the people. So lots of people are having trouble getting a dog or a cat right now as an adoption, yet there's thousands that are ready to be killed any minute. And it's very inefficient process. So if you want a French bulldog, for instance, very hard to find a rescued French bulldog or a chihuahua. And what happens is that the rescues have a chihuahua, they usually have one chihuahua. They get 20 applications who want that dog and only one gets it. The other 19, they don't go back and do anything with. So if I've brought a uh, an adopter in, then I continue to follow up and I say, what else do you want? Would a Shih Tzu work? Would a Pomeranian work? And then I find the dog for them. And so that's my own personal mission. And so I keep Excel spreadsheets going of who has what. And I do this largely on Facebook. So I have big, big, big traction on Facebook. And whenever somebody tags me on something, so I'm trying to help somebody in the city get a poodle. And so she wants a young poodle and she wants a little poodle. It's got to be under 25 pounds. And so that's what I do. I work my rescue circle to help save animals. And then oh, wow. I have 10 of my own. <laughs> 10. <laughs> I have everything. I have dogs, cats, chinchillas, uh, guinea pigs, rabbits. I have little bunnies that run around the house. And, uh, um, and then I have a horse who's actually at a barn and she's 28. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, yeah, you're, you're that's my mission. That's my real mission on life. And um, what I'm working with is some of the PP money that's coming in. I'm helping to build um, a sanctuary with one of my clients who has a tiny little rescue and we're working it into uh, a, a for-profit operation that will fund the rescue. And then I plan to put mobile vet clinics into the inner city that will be funded by tech companies. We're doing this in Texas right now. And, um, and then I may do one similar in uh, North Salem. Uh, New York. And, uh, and then that solves the problem because the mobile vet clinic is funded. And so it's going to be free every single day. Right now, if you have no money to put food on your table, you're not spending $100 to neuter your cat or dog. Mm -hmm. And two cats can produce 8 million cats in five years. Wow. Staggering. Two dogs can do 50,000 dogs. So if you just end it, you end all the suffering, you know, and, and, you know, especially for certain breeds, you know, like we see a lot of pit bulls and a lot of pity mixes and there's just, they're killed every single night. We kill them over a million dogs in uh, New York city just every year, just New York city. Yeah. We kill three and a half, three and a half million across the country. Wow. When you say we kill, what do you, what do you mean? We Americans. Americans. Yeah. And when you buy from a pet store, you're supporting the puppy mills. And the same with bunnies, you know, any kind of animal that you buy, there's so many rescues, a rescue for everything. And so that's what I do. I just try to ferret out the, the rescue places and be able to showcase them. And then if I see somebody putting their pet up for free on Craigslist, mm -hmm. and so you don't realize, and there's free, there's people looking for dogs for bait dogs, for uh, fight rings, which are rampant. And so they'll parade around as if they were a nice, sweet young girl looking for a puppy. And so there's just so much evil out there. Yeah, I think so. I just try to fight it. Yeah, I think I've heard enough about that. That's, that's yeah, really um, pretty tragic. And I didn't know anything about it. So if somebody did want to um, adopt or purchase a pet, where, where should they go if not to a pet store? Who should they call? So there's a million rescues and also your local pounds, especially in the lower income areas. You went down to Brooklyn and walked into the Brooklyn ACC. There's hundreds of dogs available and often very little cute little dogs that they either were turned in owner surrenders up in Waterbury, Connecticut. It's another horrible shelter and they kill very quickly. And there's a ton of dogs in there as well often. And a lot of times you don't understand it, but there's little poodles and little Shih Tzu mixes and all kinds, you know, and then there's a gazillion rescues, you know, in each area. And people are welcome to reach out to me. If you're looking for a dog or cat, a guinea pig or anything else, I'm happy to help. Okay, well, I'm going to put up your info again before we wrap up. This is so nice talking to you. I've learned so much today. This is great. Some of it good, some of it not so good. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you have to think of the positives. Yeah. We do make a difference, you know, we can't save everyone, but everyone we save, we make a huge difference in their life. Yeah. Well, thanks again for being on the show, Kathy. I look forward to uh, connecting with you again. Great. Yeah.